This is the Fire Dog Podcast. The views and opinions presented on today's episode are those of the speaker and do not necessarily represent the views of the Department of Defense or the United States Air Force. Welcome. My name is Ben Perry. Thank you for joining us on episode 25 of the Fire Dog Podcast. Our guest today is the Command Chief of the 30th Space Wing at Vandenberg Air Force Base, California. He's an experienced Air Force firefighter, has served as a Command First Sergeant, and is also an accomplished author. Please welcome Chief Master Sergeant Daryl Hogan. Welcome, Chief. How's it going, gentlemen? Appreciate you having me. It's going great. It's great to have you on, Chief. Um, I, I didn't know that there was a C- Command Chief firefighter out there in the universe, and uh, <laughs> happy to know that there is, and uh, happy to have you on and, and talk about your experience in, in the Air Force as a Command Chief, as a firefighter, and as a First Sergeant. Definitely. So there's actually, we're like unicorns, but there's actually two of us now. My buddy, Joy Meininger, recently uh, assumed responsibility as the command chief at Masawa Air Base oh, cool. in Japan. So oh, two, yeah. two of you guys. Cool. So uh, before we get into, you know, our talking points, can you briefly tell us about your upbringing? Uh, give us a quick overview of your military career. Yeah, definitely. So I grew up in Los Angeles, California, in the communities of Watson and the city of Linwood uh, within Los Angeles County. Uh, Pretty interesting. I had a very loving uh, family that I had growing up, but obviously uh, those those particular areas um, in Los Angeles are pretty rough. Um, So, you know, it came to a point in high school where I started to play football for Cerritos Community College and I had to make a decision. I saw the route that a lot of my peers were going and, and I saw the, the route that I was starting to, to head down and I knew that I needed to do something better. And so I always had a fascination and an affinity for uh, for serving in the military um, from playing with G.I. Joe's growing up to watching all the war movies to seeing my cousin come back. He was a sergeant major in the Marines, a command sergeant major. And I got to see him come back in the festivities following Desert Storm uh, down at Camp Pendleton and I always had a love for the military. And so uh, one day I was in a co- college career fair uh, during lunchtime in high school. And one of my buddies had talked to the Air Force recruiter and he brought me over there and and I liked what he was selling. You know, he was saying all the things that I wanted to hear. And I really wanted to lift the burden off of my parents and be able to pay for my own college education when the time came. I really wanted to see the world. And when you think about it for an 18 year old boy, uh, regardless of where you're from, I mean, what are the chances that at, you know, 18, 19, 20 years old, you can travel the world and live in different places around the globe and pay for your own college education and have a trade to fall back on on top of all that. So it all made sense to me. I remember my uh, my community college football coach trying to talk me out of it. And uh, but I made the decision. And so in October of 1995, I uh, left for basic military training and uh, I haven't looked back since. So this I'm currently on my uh, 11th assignment, I believe. So, you know, I started off at uh, Travis Air Force Base in Northern California. Like many people, you know, as a young 18 year old, I want to get back as close to home as possible. Um, So I started off at Travis and I was I was there less than two years and I headed out to Misawa Air Base in Japan from there to Herbertfield, Florida. Um, that's where I had my first deployments. I deployed a uh, Prince Sultan Air Base, Saudi Arabia in 2000. And then uh, I had actually torn my ACL during that time. I was going to get back out at, around that time. I was at about four and a half years and go back to play college football. I went on a deployment to get my veterans points. Didn't realize I already had them and I tore my ACL. So I wound up re-enlisting, right? And so 9-11 comes around and I was actually still in a splint working in the 911 dispatch center as I was recovering. And uh, tore up my profile so I could go down range. So I deployed to Thumbraid Oman. Um, October 11, 2001, I was boots on the ground at Thumbraid Oman for about five months. So went from uh, from Herbert Field to uh, Sotokano Air Base in Japan. And about that time, I was a staff sergeant. I really started to get a good understanding of what my passion was. And I had a passion for firefighting, no doubt about it. But within the fire protection world, uh, teaching and developing others was really where my heart and soul was residing. And so I applied to be an instructor at Goodfellow Air Force Base at the DOD Fire Academy, and I was accepted. And so I wanted to re-enlist. And had I not gotten that assignment, I was going to separate. And I got that job. And so I spent one year teaching Block 3, which was Structural Firefighting Principles. Um, and then I spent the next three years teaching Fire Instructor 3 and Hazmat WMD at the time um, and train a trainer. So that was a phenomenal experience. I wound up uh, going there with a the line for tech, and I left there with a the line for master. And I had a supervisor, phenomenal, still a buddy of mine, Nate Zaleski who's now uh, the, the director of fire and emergency services at Austin Community College, I believe. And, you know, he had told me about a place he had been that few other people get to visit in their careers, and that was Thule Greenland. And so I wound up going to Thule Greenland for a year, um, was pinned on Master Sergeant shortly after getting there. And then I left Thule Greenland and went to uh, what was McCord Air Force Base uh, when I got there. And shortly thereafter, we became Joint Base Lewis McCord. And uh, I saw the writing on the walls of what was going on at Joint Base Lewis McCord because the Army had the lead in, in that particular mission. And so I knew that through attrition, um, 
there was something unique that was going to happen with with my particular rank and and with the active duty folks that were there and so i had to find a, an exit path if if you will i didn't necessarily want to but i knew that as we went through that transition things may not work out for me career wise the way i wanted them to and so i actually uh, um applied to be and was accepted to be a first sergeant and so my first unit as a first sergeant was the 10th airlift squadron which was awesome and i was you know imagine a fire guy i was a career fire guy and then i go to be a first sergeant and they put me in a flying squadron and the ops world is so drastically different from every anything that i experienced as a firefighter but they were so welcoming my squadron was all c-17 pilots and load masters and they loved they absolutely loved what firefighters bring to the fight right and so they they welcome me in with uh with open arms and while I had that uh, particular unit, I was sent down range again um, to, to Kuwait, where I deployed as a first sergeant. I came back, I had a maintenance squadron, saw an opportunity to PCS to Monterey, and I was like, who in the heck gets to go be assigned at Monterey? And so I went down to Monterey to an Intel Lingua squadron, and then I went on to Davis Monthan Air Force Base, which is where I eventually made chief. And uh, <clears throat> from there, I got hired. I thought I was going back to fire, right? Even before I made chief, um, as a senior master sergeant, I figured that I was gonna go back to fire. And then I uh, wound up getting uh, assigned to Davis Monthan, which was a phenomenal assignment. And I made chief thinking now, OK, now as a chief, I'm applying for for fire chief positions. And I got hired to be the command first sergeant for Air Force Space Command, which is kind of interesting the way life works out, um, because when I got there, my supervisor was uh, the Madgecom command chief, um, Brendan Criswell. And he was replaced by Chief Roger Toberman. So Chief Roger to Toberman was my immediate supervisor. Now he is the first Chief Master Sergeant of the Space Force, or the Senior Enlist advis Advisor to the Space Force. General Raymond, who now sits on the Joint Chiefs of Staff as the Chief of Space Operations, was my Raiders Raider. So he signed my EPR. And so it was just a phenomenal assignment uh, working there at Aft Space Headquarters. I went straight from there to being hired to be the Command Chief here at Vandenberg Air Force Base. And I don't know if you guys know this, but I, so I've been here... Uh, just over a year. I'm coming up on a year and a half, and I've already and I'm getting ready to head out to my twelfth assignment. So I've been hired to be the commandant for the Chiefs Leadership Academy down at Maxwell Gunter Air Base. And so right now, and as it sits, they have the Chiefs Leadership Course for all the new Chiefs coming through. They go through that course. <clears throat> well, now it is morphing into the Chiefs Leadership Academy, and on top of just having that that uh, Chiefs Leadership Course for the new folks that put on Chief, now they're going to have a Group Superintendents Course where we're gonna train chiefs that are serving as group superintendents, and they're gonna actually attend training with group commanders. And then we're gonna have a higher level course, which is for senior enlisted leaders, our chiefs that are going on to be NAF and MAGCOM command chiefs. So the fact that I get to transition to have that responsibility is absolutely amazing. So so it's been a roller coaster ride. It's, it's been a fun journey. And I, I hit 25 years uh, in about a month. So next month I'll hit 25 years. So it's been great so far. So firefighter, first sergeant, Command chief, all of these things have <laughs> taken care of people in common, right? That sounds yes, kind of like it's your MO, just like team sports. You know, I think being in the military, the fire department, you know, as a first sergeant command chief, all of those are team sports. How do you think being a firefighter shaped your mindset and prepared you for being a first sergeant and then on to becoming a command chief? It's the bedrock. It was the foundation, right? My mentality, um, you know, so every career field within the Air Force has its own subculture. And so I know fire, right? And the mentality, like you said, it's a team sport. It's even more than that. It's a family, right? Because how many other career fields actually spend the night sleeping side by side their brothers and sisters, right? Sometimes we spend more time in a firehouse than we do at home, right? And then I've had those assignments where we work 48 hour shifts and things of that nature. I know even down at Edwards Air Force Base, haven't been stationed down there, but they work like 72 hour shifts. You know, so it's, it's really it's a team sport and it's a family. And one of the things that I learned is that, uh, you know, you don't make it to this point unless people want you to make it to this point. They say it takes a village to raise a child. It takes a massive, caring, loving support system to raise a chief. And I got that within fire and emergency services. So you want to talk about time management. You want to talk about learning how to perform under pressure. When things are, are seriously in a, a life or death type situation, you want to turn about you want to talk about working with people from every walk of life and, 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 and building a shared consciousness and having that commonality where you truly are a brotherhood, regardless of where you go in the country or where you go in the world. When you see other firefighters, there's a kindred spirit there. You know, it, it was a it was an upbringing that you can only get in a career field like firefighting. It, it really and I wouldn't trade that for the world. If I had to start over and do it all over again, I would enlist in the Air Force once again and I would accept no other job except for starting as a firefighter. 
So in the mindset of team sports, like I started this kind of analogy, what are some of the similarities, uh, differences, and maybe some of the lessons learned that you've had throughout your different types of teams, right? So the fire department has their own types of teams. Your When you're at the squadron and maybe group level, you had the triad, right? The 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 commander, the the chief, and the first sergeant that you were. And then when you became the chief, you know, you're at the wing level, you've got your your wing commander, your vice, and then you. Um, talk a bit about how those relate to each other and how you kind of navigated between each. You have to play your position. You have to know your position. You have to love and you have to master your craft, right? So all throughout high school, I ran track and I played football. And, uh, you know, when I was running track, I was part of a relay. And so you had to, if you were running first leg or anchor leg, you had to play your position. You know, in football, to have mission success, you have to have a strategic plan and you have to play your position. And and so being in a fire department was really, it was like being a, a running back or a receiver or a lineman. You know, I played my position, you know, you know, a lot of folks say that the greatest compliment you can receive as being a part of a fire crew is, is always been in position. And so when you're in, when those flames are kicking and, and you're, you're reaching 1500, 2000 degrees and, and your mask is fogged up, you need to know that your brother or sister behind you has your back. You need to know that your brother or sister who's not supposed, you know, to vent until the appropriate time is going to do that. They're going to be in position and they're going to conduct themselves accordingly. Right. And so, you know, when I transitioned to being a first sergeant, so now I no longer was serving in a civil engineer squadron and I, and I haven't since then. So it's, it's almost like coming in as a new coach, whether it's an assistant coach or a head coach, the team is already established, but now you're coming in in a leadership position and you're supposed to guide and groom and develop and train and mentor these young men and women. Right. So it's very important to sit back and observe what's going on. Look at what the dynamic is with the relationships. Look at the type of culture that's already established there. Determine whether it's good or bad. Look at who your hard hitters are, who your hard workers are, who your slow bloomers are. Look at who's sitting back and just watching everyone else work. You have to observe all of these things to be an effective leader before you come in just making change. And I'll tell you, there wasn't a drastic transition from being a first sergeant to being a command chief other than there was just greater responsibility, right? So it was like being in a small fire department and then going to a huge fire department. It's like going from good fellow, if you will, to go into Eglin where you have a massive fire department. I just had a lot more responsibilities. And each time I'm coming in as a new person and everyone, you're, you talk about living in this fishbowl, everyone's looking at you. You know, what is, how does he think? What does he do? How does he, how does he relate to his airmen? Is he inclusive? You know, or does he, does he have favorites and, and how does he treat and how does he manage? You know, so, so that, that's actually, that, that's been a lot more stressful than just being, you know, when I was in a fire department, if I'm a driver operator and I PCS and I'm PCS and as a driver operator, maybe I've progressed to crew chief, but you know, that business, you know, that craft. When I became a first sergeant and stepped outside of my comfort zone, that was stressful. Right. And so that's where I really began to learn about myself and to see what my idiosyncrasies, what my idiosyncrasies were, what my strengths and weaknesses were. And I tell you, a lot of people talk about working on your weaknesses, which you should. But I'm, I'm a huge advocate of once you determine what your strengths are, man, you need to work those until no end. Right. Like if, if you if you think about someone who's a great three point shooter, the reason they're on that basketball team is because they are a phenomenal three point shooter. So you want them to be able to slam dunk potentially, you know, that could that can add value to the team. But I've hired you to shoot three pointers. If you can throw a fastball 105 miles per hour, it's important to have a, a good tool bag with a lot of tools in it. Throw a knuckleball, throw a curve. But I hired you to throw a 105 mile per hour fastball because not a lot of other people can do that in the league. So be good at what you're supposed to be good at. Yeah, be good at what you're supposed to be good at, right? And accentuate those values and work on them in an attempt to try to master your craft and have that self-actualization to do it in a way that no one else in the enterprise, no one else in the business is doing it, right? Pretty much what I'm saying is you have to learn to be successful in whatever the role is, fire department, first sergeant, command chief, you name it, to be the best version of yourself, Right. And so one of the things I've learned through the years is, hey, I'm in I'm in competition with no one except for myself. I want to be the best version of me, because if I'm the best version of myself, then I'm going to add value to any organization that I work for. So did you ever aspire to be a command chief? Did you ever aspire to be a first sergeant? Absolutely not. Absolutely not, brother. I didn't establish I didn't aspire to be a master sergeant. Right. If, if you would if you would have known Airman Hogan, <laughs> you might have said Airman Hogan, he, if he makes it through four years, man, he's accomplished something. Well, it's pretty credible to hear stories like yours, you know, and, and how many trials and tribulations 
tribulations there are along the way and all the experiences that add up. And you talked about maybe getting out at one point in your career. And now I'm going to take an assignment for Space Command and I'm going to I would work with this general. I worked with this person. It's pretty incredible. Uh, and it just goes to show you, you know, I, I don't know, always, always set yourself up for the opportunity. You know, you never know where you're going to end up. Yeah. You know, like, how do you measure success? For me, being a command chief is not success. Being a success, the reason I consider myself to be somewhat successful is because I've overcome so many obstacles, right? I had to change my thought processes and my mentality and my ability to to operate in the realm of conflict resolution as an airman. And then when I became an NCO, I had to learn how to lead other folks and to place their needs and their desires before my own, right? And then, you know, as a, as a young NCO, I went through a divorce, And so all of these things happen in life that tend to kind of set you back, you know, making mistakes multiple times throughout my journey and learning from those mistakes and not making the same mistakes. And then trying to learn vicariously through other folks, you know, take the good and the bad. There's something to be learned from everyone, right? To take the good and the bad and to keep moving forward. I never set myself, even as a master sergeant, right? Never thought about being a chief. Um, Wasn't thinking about being a a senior master sergeant. I just figured I need to try to be the best master sergeant that I'm going to be because this is most likely the rank that I'm going to retire at. And then when I saw that I was, you know, being told by my mentors and my supervisors that, hey, there's the potential that you could be a chief. I mean, I'm sorry to be a senior master sergeant. Then I started to set my sights on that. And then when I became a senior, never imagined in 100 years that I would be a chief. And even when I became a chief, never thought I would be a diamond chief or a command chief. So, you know, I'm a big advocate of master your craft where you are. Right. And I talked about, you know, playing your position yet. Know your position and play your position. But you better also know the positions around you. Right. Because I need to be able to step in for you and fill in. I need to understand why you're thinking or why you're performing or acting in a way that you are. You know, if, if, if we're on a football field, and if I'm the cornerback, yeah, I need to master my position as a cornerback. But I also need to know what my safety is doing behind me. And I need to know that if my safety tripped or if he blew, blew a coverage, I have to back up a little further so that we don't get beat for a touchdown. Right. So master your craft, but be, then be a jack of all trades and understand the positions around you. I understand the importance of knowing all the positions around you. But. If you had to pick one of the positions that you've served in as your favorite, which one would you pick? It's probably a hard question. That's like asking me to pick a favorite child. (laughs) Which, of course, you have one. You can't tell anything. You can't say anything. Um, (laughs) That's so hard. I mean, I don't like, is there is there a job? I used to tell people, hey, I, I believe there's one job in the military cooler than being a firefighter. You know, I'll give it to them. Being a fighter pilot is probably a little bit cooler than being a firefighter, right? It's just an amazing job. Um, And then I became a first sergeant, and I was like, wow, I get to be a fly on a wall. I get to realize that, hey, the world doesn't really revolve around fire protection because this was my mindset. Um, I got to see how the flyers operate. I got to be in maintenance squadrons. I got to be in a communication squadron. You know, I got to be in a linguist, intel linguist squadron. And so that was just amazing because – I brought with me all the things that I had learned in fire protection, that leadership, that management, that flexibility, that that crisis management and that brotherhood, sisterhood. Right. And I was able to take that everywhere I went. And then being a command chief is kind of like, you know, some would say it's the culmination of all those things. But now I'm, I'm heading off to be a commandant. Right. And so I'm looking to take something from each one of those positions into my next position as we train the chiefs across the enterprise. So I, I don't think I could I could pick a favorite one. You know, I really don't, especially when you're talking about between a first sergeant and a firefighter. They're just two completely different, very unique positions. But, man, I tell you, like the diamond is in my heart. There is something to be said about being a first sergeant. I am not going to lie to you. And anyone that's worn that diamond and done it honorably, those are my brothers and sisters. And they will be to the day I die. That the things that we have to deal with from not just, you know, leading folks during the good times. But when you're talking about dealing with fatalities, I had an airman commit suicide. It was one of the hardest things I ever had to deal with, right? Because now, you know, there are so many days I spent in my commander's office crying and my commander was crying and my superintendent, my chief was crying, right? Because this was someone that was close, near and dear to our hearts. And then you have to help their family heal. I had an airman that passed uh, at another squadron for medical reasons. And while she was in a burn center, because she had been, uh, the doctor had prescribed medications while she was in a coma that were burning her organs internally from the inside out. And they didn't know it until burn marks started to show on her skin about a week later. And so I went TDY and spent 30 days living 
in the burn center waiting room and going back and forth at another installation to lodging, to sleep, to come back, to spend eight to 14 hours a day at her bedside until she finally succumbed, you know, to her injuries. These are things you never think about that you would have to do, right? But these are things I had to do as a first sergeant. I had to get on a VTC and, and walk back 72 hours and all the things that led up to my airman that committed suicide um, to the MAGCOM commander in AATC and to all the group and squadron commanders, chiefs and first sergeants, because my commander wasn't available to do that. When my airman passed away to medical issues, I never imagined that I would be in a situation to go to her funeral and then read her commendation medal in front of about three, four hundred people at her funeral and to serve as her pallbearer. Right. And so when you wonder about like, what is it about being a first sergeant? And I would pray that no one would ever have to deal with those things. And I'll tell you, there are shirts that have dealt with things 10 times more traumatic than that. But those types of things build a special type of bond. Maybe no different than being in a very active fire department where you're really dealing with a lot of things that the average firefighters don't see. It just builds a special, unique type of bond that you just can't get anywhere else. So, and so that's why I say that that diamond is imprinted on my heart forever. So I think just being an airman. Right. I think that's probably what would sum up your favorite job because yeah, pretty you, much. <laughs> you can take a little bit of fire, a little bit of first sergeant, a little bit of chief and mix it all together. And it's, you know, that's the Air Force for you. And it sounds like it's been a pretty exciting ride, you know, not always good, but exciting. Definitely. Yeah, it's, it's been a roller coaster, you know, so you take the good with the bad and it's been so much more good than bad. Like I said, I wouldn't trade it for the world. I mean, who else gets to do what we do? you know, and live around the world. You know, people will save their whole lives to go and visit another country, to vacation for a week if you're lucky. And, and I mean, you're, you're, you're in Germany. You know, I, I got to live in Japan. I got to live in Honduras. I've, I've traveled all around the world. You know, I've had four deployments. Um, so who gets to do that? I mean, it's, it's just phenomenal. And so literally, like I can remember going back 10 years later, TDY to Japan and just being welcomed by the Japanese local local national firefighters with open arms as if I had just left the day before. And so when you talk about literally having friends and, and relationships that are like family across the globe, I mean, the business doesn't get much better than, like you said, just being an airman. Well, I'm connected with you on social media and I, I still see you hanging around with fire dogs, you know, and you seem, you still seem real proud of our community, which Man, I'm, I'm the, happy to see, blood. <laughs> you know, and, and so how do you, how do you find it? You know, do you find it easy to stay plugged in with them? Uh, even though you've been out for a handful of years now, do you have any yeah. plans to get back to the job at some point in the future? Yeah. You know, social media makes it really easy to stay connected. You know, had this been 20 years ago, I don't know that I would be able to maintain those connections the way we do on social media. Right. So if you're posting pictures about your kids that I saw when they were born, I get to see them grow up into adulthood and see all the phenomenal things that you're doing and, and the family vacations and, and all the great things that you're doing at work. So social media makes it easy to stay plugged in. I'll tell you, man, I would love to come back to fire protection. Um, I've actually tried on multiple occasions, but, you know, life is taking me in a different direction. And, and it's still something that I'll look at when I retire. If I have the opportunity to come back to fire, um, you know, I wouldn't trade that for the world. It, it's, it, yeah, fire, fire's in my heart. You know, you, you, you can't change the pot that you grew out of, right? That, that, that pot will always be, that soil is always there. And so uh, more so than anybody else that I've experienced in my career, I stay plugged into my fire dogs. Hey, beyond the brotherhood, sisterhood of the career field, is there anything in particular you miss about fire protection? I don't know, going on emergency responses is something that would probably, I would probably miss being out for a while. Yeah. So you guys know how it is. So in fire, or well, maybe it's just me, right? So my, my upbringing, cause I say that I was raised, right. I was raised in the fire department. Um, you know, a lot of guys aspire to be on rescue, right? Because rescue goes on everything. And you you, you have the, 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 the cool, shiny truck and you go on all the medical runs. I've always been an engine guy. I, I, I love the engine. I love first run. You know, I want to put the wet stuff on the red stuff. So that's what I miss. The, if, if you ask me, so there's two jobs. If I could go back to and have to spend the rest of my life doing it, one would be a crew chief. Uh, when, I, when I was stepped up to, to be a crew chief as a staff sergeant, I mean, I just felt like I was born to do this right. And I just remember going out, having a hard day of training and uh, afterwards taking my crew to the to the bowling alley on base and getting some milkshakes. And it wasn't something that we did every day. Right. So those small things like, man, if, you know, Staff Sergeant Hogan's taking us to get milkshakes, we, we've been busting our butt. You know, we've been working hard. And it's those little things. It doesn't take a, a, a decoration written up or, or something on the EPR. It's those small things that show that, hey, we're a team, we're a family, and we've busted our butts, and we're on call and ready for whatever, you know, the world throws at us. Those are the things that I miss. And the other job, just because, 
you know, it's largely the reason I'm going to be a commandant. The, the academic environment, training and education and developing, that's, like I said, that's what I love. And my time at Goodfellow, man. So this was, being, being an instructor at Goodfellow Air Force Base was the first time that I had worked with Navy firefighters, Marine firefighters, you know, and, and, and Army firefighters. And you got like 200 of your fire dog brothers and sisters there all in the same building. And you know what a lot of people don't know about Goodfellow? They think we're just instructors down there. When there were massive grass fires and emergencies and things of that nature in Texas, who do you think had more equipment? more vehicles than anybody else within probably a hundred or 200 mile radius. It's that fire academy. Walk through the high bay and look at those trucks. So I got to go on a lot of real world incidents. You know, we take a tanker out to fight fires and whatnot or to supplement other city and county departments. So it was phenomenal. Being a fire instructor, that's where I think I hit my stride. Being a fire instructor for me was kind of like the coach having you at wide receiver for two years, and then your your uh, junior year he put you at running back, and everyone's like, "Oh crap, that's where we should have had him the whole time." Like that was that was where I really hit my stride. I think a lot of people could probably identify with that uh, middle tier, middle level leadership, crew chief, and then of course mentorship and training all the time. Those are things that I love still, you know. Um, but so transitioning a little yeah. bit. Uh, you know, you have a u- unique perspective in that you've served in the fire department, fire protection. You've served as a first sergeant, command chief. You've seen a whole uh, bunch of different levels within the Air Force. With regard to equal opportunity, diversity, uh, race and gender, inclusion, all that stuff, how does FES look? Uh, and how do you think that, you know, if we can improve and or take actional, actionable steps towards improvement? I'll tell you, uh, FES, just like everyone else, looks a lot better now than it did even when I joined. Um, you know, we're, I, I was mentioning this. Uh, we had our senior NCO professional enhancement seminar, our, our induction ceremony recently. And I kind of talked to him about this in my speech. Um, you know, a lot of times you hear us old folks say it was a different Air Force back then. It really was, right? But society has grown. But even faster than society, the Air Force and our military has really grown when you talk about diversity and inclusion. Um, I can remember there being racial tensions, you know, in my first at my first base in the fire department. That was a small part of my introduction um, based on things that were going on in a society and just just based on on how the nation was at that particular time. I can remember a, a couple key incidents that really acted to divide the department in, to some extent. And then when I left my first assignment and went on to Masawa, Japan on my second assignment, I started to see you know, with each assignment, I started to see more diversity and more inclusion. And so, um, you know, I, it, it was, oh, man, I'm trying to, how long was I in? I was in quite a few years before I even knew that a, like an African-American fire chief existed in the Air Force. And I'm sure they did in 1995. Don't, don't, I don't question that they did. But as I progress, you know, it took me three assignments that, to, to even know that that one existed. Um, to this day, and I know it's probably because I've been out of fire protection for quite a while, but I, I've still yet to see a, a woman or a female active duty fire chief. I've seen one in a guard or reserves, but I haven't seen a female. Um, but but things have gotten a lot better, right? Because you see a lot more diversity within the fire department overall. And I think fire is one of those things that just based on the fact that, like I said, we live together um, and there is such a, a team or our family type environment that, you know, diversity was bound. We do everything together. We laugh, we joke, we cry, we go on emergency responses, you know, very hairy situations that we deal with. So that naturally, even if you think back to, you know, a time and point in America when racial tensions were at their height, um, you know, when you look at soldiers and Marines and some of the things they were dealing with in war, bonds were established that weren't established back in American society, right? Because when you literally have to, when your life, relies on your brother or sister to your right and left, your front and back, then it, it kind of builds a bond. And and it starts to tear down barriers of prejudices and biases that you might have grown grown up with. I've talked to a number of chiefs, you know, even within the last year that <clears throat> it's it's very awkward for them to go home and engage with old peers or even some family members because of the conversation and the things that are said. And you're like, man, I've been in for 10 years. I've been in for 20 plus years. And I don't even think like that anymore. And, and I was blind to the fact that some of the things that were said or done that I saw growing up were not right. Right. And so through education and through experiences with our brothers and sisters, we kind of grow out of that. So I think I know that fire and emergency services, along with, you know, every other AFSC within the Air Force, we're on the right track. I mean, you look at the diversity and, you know, you go to any base and you're not looking for, hey, we're, you know, are, are, are the white folks over here? Are the black folks over there? How many women? It's just 
we're, we're airmen or space professionals, and that's, that's all that matters. You know, we have our first chief master sergeant of the of the Air Force that's female. Chief Wright just rolled out. Chief master sergeant of the Air Force Wright, he was the second African American. And and these things are, you know, we celebrate these things, but they're becoming just the norm, right? Like when you think about the love that that chief master sergeant of the Air Force Wright had. No one was looking, saying, "Oh, he's a black chief master in the Air Force." And like, I know there's, hey, that's enlisted Jesus, right? Like, it's that's that's yeah, you, our. You chief, make a good so. point if you take a step back. There's been a whole lot of progress. It's hard to kind of see that when you're in the moment. And the same thing, and you made a good point about going back home and interacting with people that you knew uh, in your hometown or your family, even. And if you're away for ten years and you go back, you're like, "Wow, I've changed," and you don't realize it. And right. I think the same could be said for the military and for fire protection. We're just such more of a melting pot you know, than, than the, what you would see represented in a small geographic location where people don't move away and they don't, um, you know, exchange ideas and cultural norms with other folks outside of their own circles where we, we come in and we have to work together. And that's where you might see a higher level of conflict with us. But over time, I think that probably turns into a higher level of success. If I could, if I could yeah, probably higher level guess of understanding. I don't know, chief from your, from your position there to command chief, you probably see, um, you know, the whole, the whole base, not just the fire department, but right. you know, you probably see a good, good mix, um, with all the discussions that are going on right now too. Yeah. And we, you know, we've really uh, been on the forefront of just kind of leading the whole, you know, all of our measures for diversity and inclusion. And we've had so much positive feedback and so many people that were just waiting to get involved because, I mean, like I said, the society is different, but the military is a lot different and it's a lot better. Even, you know, just our thought processes and our understanding of, of things of d how important uh, diversity is to mission readiness. It's a readiness issue. Right. At the end of the day, it's a readiness issue. And if you and I have issues based on gender, our sexual preferences our are the color of our skin that impacts our ability to go out and get the mission done. Like that is not what you or I need to be worrying about when we get that call, when those bells go off and we have to respond, right? We launch rockets and we test missiles here. So what happens is uh, in the Northern tier where we have our nuclear enterprise, they take the nuclear warheads off, they put a dummy head on, they bring it here. And so we launch, we test Minuteman three uh, missiles and we launch rockets. We don't have time for the foolishness, <laughs> right? Like we, we have to be homogenous in our thinking and in our diversity. And that's the only way we're going to have mission success. Yeah. One thing I realized recently was that uh, without trust or without the maximum amount of trust that that's there, you know, the, the job's not going to go as well. And, uh, you know, it was j just recently, you know, with uh, everything that's going on in society, that's something that I realized because we sat down and we had these conversations with everybody and, you know, the things that I heard, I'm like, wow, you know, I, they might not, may not trust me as much as they could, you know, and we need to fix that because we're going to be a much better team if they do trust me and I do trust them. That's one thing that, you know, and, and again, readiness, you know, it's going to affect readiness if they don't trust you. Yeah. Trust and relationships are everything. I preach that all the time, right? Build relationships. At the end of the day, I can tell you, I have been on some freaking phenomenal fire emergencies, medical responses, you name it. You know, I've seen a lot of stuff. Unless you were there with me, you don't remember it. You don't know about it. And you really don't care. But what you do care about, what you do remember are the relationships, right? So to me, relationships are important. How I made you feel, um, if I built you up, if I tore you down, if I inspired you or motivated you, or if I treated you like crap, those are the things you're going to remember about me, right? You don't care what happened when I was a staff sergeant or, you know, if a plane went down and I was the first in on that, or if I pulled somebody, extricated someone out of a vehicle. When I arrive as your chief, you could care less. Hey, chief, are you here to help me in my growth and my development? Are you going to take care of me and the team? Right. And like you said, there has to be that trust. I have to trust you. I can remember being deployed to Afghanistan um, with a six person firefighting team. We're the only airmen in a three five radius and, and we're fire protection. And I'll tell you, I was a master sergeant and uh, I have never been very mechanically inclined. And they, they put us on a fob and there's two P-19s. We have no fire station. We're operating out of our rooms pretty much and we're rotating schedules. And of course, the P-19s are broken. Right. And so it was my senior airman, vehicle mechanic minded, you know, firefighter who made sure that our trucks were running so that we were able to respond to anything that happened. Right. That trust has got to be there. And, and rank has nothing to do with that. Right. It, it's a human thing. Can I trust you as a human being and as a professional? That's what separates us from amateurs. 
right? Can I trust you as a professional to th do the things that need to be done to get the mission done, right? And like you said, the more diversity we have, you know, the better we off, better off we are as a team. Well, Chief, I think you probably fit the description of professional pretty well. You've got three CCAF degrees, a bachelor's degree, a master's degree, multiple executive level courses, and you've authored two books. Um, <laughs> your, your first called It's More Than a Job, Life and Leadership Through the Eyes of a First Sergeant. And then most recently, Life as a Command Chief, just a few months ago. And I've got, and I've got a copy here. I just finished it today. <laughs> awesome. Um, you know, I, I just finished it, like I said, and, I, you know, I found some great takeaways and I'm, you know, clearly not a command chief. Uh, maybe I can relate to a few of them because of what I do. You know, I'm, a, I'm actually a, an exec for a command chief of which you speak highly. So I appreciate that. <laughs> um, but, you know, there's so many nuggets that other people can take away from from firefighters to fire chief um, and, and everyone in between. So I'm just curious what inspired you to write uh, these couple books? Yeah, you know, you just over time as you grow and mature and develop. You, you find that there are seeds planted in you that you may not have even realized were, were in there, right? And so that's, as leaders, I think it's so important that we help our airmen identify the greatness that's in them. Every airman and every space professional that joins our ranks has something special inside of them that, that's unique to them. And so if we, lead, if we lose that airman, if we lose that space professional, then we lose that talent and, and that ability that they brought to the table that no one else could really bring. So I'll tell you, um, I, so when I was in high school, I, I'll just say that I didn't attend every class like I should have, right? So I found myself needing to take an English, we called it um, intercession because I went to year round school. Others folks will call it summer school. And it was a creative writing class in summer school, if you will. And, and that's where I'll never forget uh, the teacher just saying, hey, just write what's on your mind, write, write what you're passionate about. And when I turned in my work, she was really impressed by it. And I got to read it in front of the other students and uh, they were impressed by it. Right. And so that's when I knew that, hey, you know, this writing thing is pretty cool. I'm like 16 years old at the time. I didn't realize that a seed had been planted in me that needed to be watered. It needed to be given sun and it needed to be nurtured so that it could grow. And so over time, you know, coming into the Air Force and then, you know, being a firefighter, I started to read books about firefighting. I started to think, hmm, I, I've had experiences, you know, maybe I should write something. But I never had the confidence to do that. And then when I became a first sergeant, you know, I really started to experience things that I had never imagined. And again, I wanted to write, but I didn't have the confidence because I said, well, maybe if I ever make chief, maybe people will be more interested in listening. And then finally, uh, when I when I got hired to be a diamond chief, I was like, you know what? Now's the time. And, and I should not have waited that long because who knew, who knows how many other books were inside of me that the world will never get to experience because I didn't write. So, I, number one, I encourage folks when you start to identify what your talents and what your gifts are, like what, what your passion is. You need to take care of like you need to develop that and you need to manifest that so that the world can benefit from it. And so as a first sergeant, I wanted to write books that would benefit other first sergeants, uh, those that wanted that that aspired to be first sergeants. And then also to benefit chiefs that maybe didn't understand what those first sergeants who weren't part of their AFSC brought to the fight and commanders that maybe didn't quite appreciate what the first sergeant brings as a senior enlisted advisor to the triad. Right. And then when I became a command chief, you know, I, I had that writing bug. And so after going through a lot of uh, significant trials and tribulations and successes here at Vandenberg, I said, you know what? There wasn't a whole lot of training to become a command chief. You go to a course and it's about three or four days long and you get a lot of great briefings, but there's no CBT. There's there's no uh, training course that you go away to. So I said, you know, let me pay it forward and pass on some of my experiences so that future command chiefs will maybe have a better start than I had coming into this job. Maybe they won't be as nervous and as anxious. They won't have so much anxiety like I had coming into this job. And hey, let me make sure that these command chiefs understand the importance of an executive assistant, you know, mm -hmm. being equally important to the role that you're serving in as a command chief. And let me help them to understand what first sergeants bring to the table and how much community involvement you're going to have. So I'm, I'm a huge advocate of that, right? Like I'm past 20 years. So what am I serving for at this point? If I'm not passing on leadership nuggets to help the next folks coming up behind me and on the side of me, then what am I really doing? If I'm not doing that, I need to get out of the way. And so along the line, I realized that, hey, I have a passion for writing. I've written a couple, you know, response to articles for Air Force Times and things of that nature. And I just decided to, to put it into book form. And speaking to those people who are aspiring authors or maybe have thoughts in their head that they want to put on paper, what, what kind of advice could you give to those people? 
Yeah, write it down and don't beat yourself up over it, right? Rough drafts are so important. Put your ideals down. Um, I use Create Space through Amazon uh, to publish my books. I reached out to to other chiefs and and, and actually uh, there's a, a former fire dog, Tavio Soto. I think he might've retired as a master sergeant. Yeah, I have um, his book on the shelf right over yeah, here. Yeah, right. So he was the first fire dog that I knew an active dude in the Air Force that wrote a book. So here I am, I'm, I'm a chief and I'm like, hey, Tavio, brother, I want to put some words down. I want to put my thoughts down. I want to put my emotions and my passion down in a book to pass it on. So he was the first person that really helped me to build a guideline on, Hey, this is how you kind of structure your thoughts. And then uh, another chief, uh, he was a, he's a former first sergeant as well. Hamp Lee, he writes books. He now serves down at air university. Uh, he was another guy that I reached out to and said, Hey, how do I do this? Right. So, so finding people that, that are like-minded that have similar passions, that are a couple steps ahead of where you want to be and reaching out saying, Hey, teach me something about that. Right. Like if you want to learn to work on cars, you're probably going to look to the fire dogs that, you know, work on their cars regularly and say, Hey, teach me how to change brakes. Teach me how to, you know, uh, work on my transmission. And so that's what I did. So what, uh, what's your next book? Are you going to write one on your time as a firefighter (laughs) or, or what's next, you know? I probably will. Um, I, I have no idea. So I have, I always have about four or five books in the works. Um, and so I just, they're just, they're not completed. And, and I'm a very, uh, I'm, I'm like a bit of an emotional roller coaster. And sometimes something will inspire me and I get, it, it becomes obsessive, right? And so I'll spend the next month or two months or three months working on something. And then overnight I might lose that drive. And then I go, I go change my focus to something else. And so the reason those two books are written is because I found myself in a space where I, I had that book to write and I just obsessively you know, turned off the TV. I'm not watching sports. Um, and actually, you know, the fact that COVID happened and sports went away is, probably helped. <laughs> yeah, that helped write this this book about being a command chief. And I just kind of obsessively focus on on manifesting what's going on in my mind and in my heart. So so I don't know. So I'll tell you, I have a book about uh, becoming a staff sergeant, um, becoming an NCO that's almost done. I think it's one of the most important transitions that airmen make in their careers, going from being just one of the guys or gals to actually down being accountable for other people's actions. Um, and then I, ha- I have a couple books that kind of speak more to kind of spiritual success, spiritual inspiration, uh, things that have helped me along the way, um, scriptures that I've reflected back on and that I still do to this day to help me. So I have those types of books that are written, So I, I, I but I don't know what will be next, what I'll actually publish next. What kind of recommendations could you make for books? What are your favorites? Ah, oh, so many. If you were to walk in my house right now and you'd see a book, a couple bookshelves with over 400 books right now. And so one of my favorites, um, I, I try to give recommendations that a lot of other people may not have already heard about or read. So one of my favorites is Pete Carroll's book, Win Forever. Well, you want to talk about having a mentality that you, just to be able to think differently than the average person thinks. Pete Carroll's Win Forever is a phenomenal book. Um, there's another book called The Mental Game of Baseball. And I'm kind of like a mediocre baseball fan, but this is all about the thought process. The fact that if you think about baseball, if you have a batting average of 300, right, that's considered to be a successful batter, that's 30%. How many places in life can you do something well 30% of the time and you're considered a success, right? And and that's for the great ones. And so there's a thought process that goes along with um being a successful batter or playing baseball at a high level that I think is so important to, to human performance. Uh, there's a book called the goal, get the goal giver go dash G I V E R. That's another great book. Um, so there's so many that are out there. Um, uh, can't hurt me. Right. That's very famous. That that's another one that's, that's, that's very inspirational. So there's, a, I, I try to read, I try to read about a little bit of everything. You know, I read space books. Um, I have a small book. Um, written by uh, Neil deGrasse Tyson that's on uh, astrophysics. You know, I just, I just try to read a little bit of everything to just kind of expand myself. My grandmother always told me, you know, until the day you die, you need to be growing and, and, and building your brain, you know, working that muscle, growing uh, professionally and, and as a human being. So, Well, how often do you read, Chief? You know, how do you find time in the day, your busy day? Yeah, so th- unfortunately, there are some days where I, where I 
don't get to read, but generally speaking, I'd say at least five, five times a week. I'm reading for at least 15 minutes, right? So if it's getting up first thing in the morning, reading a little bit, or I personally like to read at night before I go to bed. I think it helps me sleep. I like to read until my eyes get tired. And so I might put in 30 minutes to an hour or set a goal of, hey, I want to read 50 pages. So generally either first thing in the morning or uh, sometimes I read at lunch on my lunch break. And at other times, like I have about three or four books, you know, on my desk. So if I get a break, or a lunch break, then, you know, I'm reading that, but, uh, but I prefer to read at night. So you're almost done with the command chief gig. You got a job at the chief leadership course. So what are your expectations for the move? You know, how often are you going to stay in that position? And then you know, what's, what's after that for you? I have no idea uh, what's after that. Um, I, like, I'm not even looking past that. I just, I want to get down there. So this is, again, this is something completely new and drastically different from anything I've done in my career up to this point. So I really want to get down there and see how things go, see how they flow, get a feel of the, the dynamic and the culture. And so the good thing is, is that Mike Wester is the current uh, commandant of operations down there for the teacher leadership course. And, and he is phenomenal, right? This, he was actually my uh, Air Force Senior NCO Academy instructor. And then I, you know, I see him uh, every year at AFSA Paxton. And so I've talked to him over the last couple of years about, hey, man, you know, if that job ever came open, I'd be really interested. So I know that I have huge shoes to fill because this guy is is absolutely phenomenal. I just want to go down there and kind of sprinkle my little flavor into it. And I, I really I want it to be what the Air Force needs. Right. I want it to be the training and the development, the strategic level training and development that, that the Air Force needs of its E-9s, of its chiefs. We also train joint service E-8s and E-9s as well. Um, I know that Chief Master Sergeant of the Air Force, Joe Bass, has a vision. I know that the Air University commanders and command chiefs and born centers, they have a vision. And I just really want to fulfill that vision, but also sprinkle my little unique dust into it and, and just, just kind of be myself. I want to thrive in that role and just be the best that I can be. So, so that's, that's really my, my only focus uh, for going down there. And I'm really looking forward to it. How long is the job for? Is it a, is it a set time? So it's a two year minimum. So I don't know how long, and you know, <laughs> for chiefs, that could be 12 months. You, you just never know. We, we move quite a bit. Um, you know, I pinned on chief in March of 2017, and uh, I am headed to my third chief assignment. So, and I've actually worn chief at four different bases at this point. Davis Monthan, Peterson, Vandenberg, and now heading to Maxwell Gunter. So, so it's a two year minimum. So I don't know how long, I'll, how, how long I'll be down there. Or I'm not even really looking at what's next. I just want to kind of get down there and thrive. And then once I get my feet wet and have an understanding and, of you know, what the expectations are and make sure that I'm taking the courses in the right direction. And then, you know, I'll get to a point in the next year and a half to two years where I start looking at what's next. One last question for you, Chief. If there is a firefighter out there or somebody listening to this podcast who aspires to be a command chief, what kind of advice could you give them? I, I know that you talked about a, a, a lot about a lot of things, but if there was one or two, maybe three things, what would you tell them? I would tell them to know that there are things lined up in their lives, in their path that they may not be able to rationalize right now. They may not be able to believe right now. They may not have a good understanding of those things, but there are blessings and there are ranks and positions and opportunities and assignments that they can't even imagine, right? They have greatness inside of them. And so they need to ensure that they do not make decisions that burn bridges or that tear down the roads to greatness. I can tell you that if I could go back, there are some decisions that I made. You say, well, hey, you made it to command chief. Ooh, by the grace of God, right? Because I made poor decisions along the way. You know, I, I was I was an airman at one point trying to fit in and even as an NCO and making some, some decisions that were not in the best interest of what the universe had designed for me to become and to grow into, right? And so if I could have, if, if I wish I had a crystal ball to be able to show folks just a little glimpse of, hey, this is what you can become, right? So, so, so think about that, that picture right there before you make that decision, whether it's a drinking decision, whether it's a relationship decision, understand that you are destined for greatness. And greatness doesn't mean a rank and greatness is not a pay scale, but understand that, that your greatness can mean the impact that you're able to have on others. But if you make poor decisions along the way, they can potentially derail you in a way that your greatness never comes to fruition, right? Like there is something special inside each and every individual. And like I said, those seeds have to be watered. They have to be given sun. They have to be fed so that that greatness can grow out of it, whatever that greatness looks like. And it may not even be while you're on active duty, but active duty could just be one small step 
in, in the bigger picture of your life and you go out to be an entrepreneur or, you know, whether it's a firefighter, whatever it might be that you do outside of military service, but make decisions right now that are the best decisions for the best version of you. So, and, and I'll leave it at this, right? You hear it said all the time, hey, be true to yourself. I'm from LA, right? We're very prideful about where we're from. And it's one of the sayings we'd always say, hey, what I'm doing is just being true to me. And what I learned is, nah, I, I don't need to be true to myself. I need to be true to the best version of myself. Because usually when you say, hey, I'm just being me, I'm keeping it 100, I'm being true to myself, that's making excuses for the decisions that you've made. It's making excuses for the for the conditions and the situation that you refuse to step out of. But if I'm true to the best version of myself, if I'm being true to the best me, the best me was a command chief or a diamond chief or a commandant chief. The best me was a great father or a great husband, right? And so that's a different version of who I was when I used to say, well, I'm just keeping it real and being true to myself. So think about being true to the best version of yourself and making decisions that give you opportunities, right? I can't tell you what you're going to grow up to be or, or what you're going to you know, be once you kind of come into full fruition of, of what success looks like for you. But I can tell you that if you make good decisions now and master your craft, then you will have opportunities and you'll actually be able to choose your paths in the future. And there's another level to this, right? With leaders or supervisors of these people, know that everybody has untapped potential. And you, you should never give up on somebody is my point. You, you see it happen from time to time. Somebody makes a bad decision. Maybe they're not putting all their effort in and these other people are and you want to help those people out, which I get. But you should still always try to get the best out of every person. That's something that I try to remind myself every day. Because you can get discouraged as a leader Yes. Uh, th these people don't care. And so why do, why should I care? Right. But it's your job, I think. It's my job to try to get, make them live up to their potential. So and, I think hey, there's another level there. And Matt, and that happens at different times in different people's lives, right? So let's just be honest. There are people that just, they have no business serving on active duty in the Air Force or the Space Force, right? Like they're, they're just not cut from that cloth or, you know, and this is small, minute percentage of people, right? Or they make decisions and they refuse to learn and grow from those decisions. But there's other people that has, and, and even for those people that are not necessarily cut from the cloth, dang it, they're still human beings. And I'm going to treat them as best I can as a mentor and a supervisor and as, and as a leader. And even in my command chief capacity, I do this and mentor people all the way into the point that they transition out of the Air Force administratively. Right. Because they are human beings and who knows what phenomenal things are going to go on and do. But then there are people that it might take a significant event or it might take a light bulb going off as a senior airman or as a tech sergeant that really makes them shift and turn, you know, their career and their life around. I'll tell you. I was a tech sergeant, fire instructor at Goodfellow Air Force Base, and I still hadn't got a really good grasp of my of my short temper at that time, right? And and I and I I, I snapped one time, and my supervisor, my buddy Nate Zaleski, who was the master sergeant of our block, he was in a position where he could have handled that a couple different ways, right? And it wasn't in front of students or anything like that. It was in a, it was in our office, and it was with another instructor. And Nate could have very easily written me an LOR or reported me to, you know, the course directors to say, hey, you know, his attitude is not commensurate with what we're trying to do here. And I'll never forget Nate Zaleski taking me outside, out back, and having a heart-to-heart -heart talk. And he said, DJ, you do all this talk about how proud your mom is of you and your family and all the things you want to achieve. But yet and still, you'll snap and lose your temper and, and jeopardize everything, everything that you've worked so hard for. And a light bulb went off. I'm a tech sergeant serving on a special duty. I had been in over 10 years and it took to that point for a light to go off and it changed my career and my life around. And I started looking at my inner circle at the people that I let into my inner circle and the things that they were putting into my ear and saying to me that were inspiring certain types of thought, right? And when I left Goodfellow, I left as a tech sergeant with an MSM, one of the only ones to do that. And the first time I had ever won a wing level award, I was, I was the uh, NCO of the year, right, for the wing. And it was because, largely because of, of you know, Master Sergeant Nate Zaleski's mentorship and the fact that he saw something in me that I didn't quite see in myself. And he saw that, hey, I was potentially going to jeopardize you know, my future and the potential that I had to become, you know, a senior NCO and, and, and just an effective leader overall. So you're hundred percent right, Matt, like as supervisors, as leaders, it is our job. It is our duty to America to identify the greatness in airmen and space professionals, even when they don't see it in themselves and to help that come to fruition and manifest. 
And if yeah. that greatness is in the Air Force, that's fantastic. If it's that's outside fantastic. the Air Force, that's okay. Perfectly too. fine. Yep. Well, Chief, this has been an outstanding session of talking about the things that motivate and inspire you and the good things that have come of that motivation over the years. Uh, I've got a couple minutes left. I want to see you. I want to turn it over to you. You know, you have hundreds of firefighters at your uh, at your attention right now. So uh, take a few minutes, talk to them, and then we'll close it up. Hey, Fire Dogs, like I said, you are serving in one of the best professions that exists on the face of this earth. So appreciate every moment of it. Uh, appreciate the grind. Appreciate the hard work. Um, you know, if you're if you're riding a vehicle, learn every every tool on that on that truck better than anyone else. If you're working in fire prevention, learn everything you can about the infrastructure of that installation. Like regardless of where you're planted, grow where you're planted because you're there for a reason. And you may not see it in totality or holistically now, but you're there for a reason. So so work as hard as you can. Work smarter, not harder. Know that you have greatness inside of you and enjoy the journey. Right. And I get it. If your goal is to be a fire chief, great. If your goal is to be a command chief, great. If your goal is to commission and be an 06 one day, great. But man, I'm telling you, if you're so focused on that, that you're not enjoying the things that are happening on a daily basis right now, then you're going to find yourself. And I've seen these folks. You're going to find yourself as a chief or as an 06 a little bit sad realizing that I, I just bypassed 10, 15, 20 years of working with some of the greatest human beings on planet Earth and having some of the most phenomenal experiences, and I didn't even allow myself to enjoy them, right? So don't be so focused on where you're trying to get that you're not looking at where you are, because if you do that, then you're going to crash, right? So so enjoy the journey, have fun, and uh, hey, it, it, it's a blessing for me to be able to serve, you know, shoulder to shoulder with you all. I know you're doing phenomenal things around the world. Some of my fire dogs here right now, they're deployed in Iraq and Africa, and I'm staying in touch with them. They're doing phenomenal things. So just know that you have one of the best professions, and you're in one of the best crafts known to mankind. So so enjoy the journey, and uh, just make the most of it. It's a, it, Treat your life as if it's just a blank slate. Right. It's a blank canvas and, and, and you have the painter's brush and the paint. So you paint whatever colors you want, uh, you know, and you and you just if, if you have a brick, you can you can build a shack or you or you can build a cathedral. It's up to you. Right. It's all about perspective. And, and some and I'll say this and I'll leave it at this. Some fire dogs right now and some other airmen are in situations or positions. They just want to move. Right. They want a different supervisor or they're upset. Things aren't going well. They want a PCS. Just know that everything happens for a reason. I've been there, too. Right. And there's been times where I wasn't stratted. I was upset about that. I wanted to PCS. I was upset about that. I wanted to change in supervisor. Now that I reflect and look back on all those things, I realize that there is something to be gained, something to be learned. And had I not taken that route, I wouldn't be where I am today. Right. Those those obstacles and those hurdles and those trials and tribulations were the windy road that it took to get to where I am today. And this is not my finish point. Right. There's, there's still a lot more left. There's a lot more gas in the tank. And then above and beyond just trying to be a great chief, man, I'm trying to be a better father and a better husband. At the end of the day, that's what matters. And, and I'll say this. I'll leave it at this. I had a group chief when I was deployed. He said the two most important decisions you ever make in your life is what you choose to do professionally and who you choose to spend your life with. Regardless of how well you do one of those things, it's meant to come to an end. The other one is supposed to be till death do your part. My point is don't be that person that gets all the rank and you're at your retirement and the front row is empty. Because you can be the best chief, the best fire dog, the best airman or space professional that you can ever imagine, and your career is going to come to an end somewhere around 30 years. And you want your family and you want your mental, emotional, and spiritual health and well-being to be intact. Because that family is in there for the long haul. When you take off the uniform, you should have your husband, wife, your children, your loved ones, whoever that might be, at your side. So do not sacrifice your family for that title or for that position or for that rank. It's, it's, it's a journey and they take it with you. We serve and they sacrifice. So enjoy the ride. Know that you're destined for greatness and uh, keep your, your mental and spiritual health intact and your family intact. And you guys are going to be all right. Well, Chief, great words. Great way to close us out. Um, thank you so much for coming on. You know, I've, I connected with you at McCord back, you know, six, seven years ago now when you were there and, uh, you know, I was motivated and, and inspired from you then and just as much now today, so many years later. So appreciate, appreciate you coming on and, uh, we will catch you next time. All right. Congrats to you brothers. This is an awesome platform. I'm very proud of you. Thanks for your time, chief. Thank you for listening to this episode of the fire dog podcast. 
You can find more content and episodes just like this regularly posted to our Facebook page at facebook.com forward slash the fire dog podcast and on Instagram at the fire dog podcast. That is the fire D A W G podcast. Don't forget to hit that subscribe, like, and follow button to stay plugged into every new episode. Last, we'd love if you would share this podcast episode with your friends and coworkers, either right here on social media or right there at the firehouse. This has been Perry and Matt Wilson with our guest, Chief Daryl Hogan. Until next time, stay safe.